how much content do you need to publish per month to get to 1.5 million organic hits from Google. Hi, I'm Jared Krause, host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast, and today I'm speaking with Nicholas Jordan, who has grown four projects from zero to 1,000 plus organic hits per month, and the largest he was able to grow grow from zero to 1.5 million organic hits per month without building any backlinks or any tech SEO. Now, this project was a massive home run. It helped his client go from seed stage to a two two. $110 $110 million Series B valuation led by A16 and grew his agency from one to 45 writers and editors in just a two year period. Now, in this podcast episode, Nick and I specifically talk about his SEO strategy that he used to grow this site to 1.5 million organic hits per month. We talk about how much content they were actually creating per month to be able to get to that. We talk about how they structured the content, so what it looked like in compared to their competitors, how it had to have more of certain things, which you'll find out about in the podcast episode, to actually be able to have those pieces of content rank and get traffic without any of that paid backlink building or or technical SEO within deep within the site. We also talk about hiring. Nick is very big on hiring, so we talk about how to hire the best writers and how it can be a numbers game, what sort of funnels and systems and things you need to have put in place before you start hiring. Um, and we also talk about how to train and promote your writers to editors and then have and then help your writers and editors scale as you scale to help all of that team underneath you train your new writers and new editors as you build a bigger team for your blog. This is such a valuable episode, guys. You're absolutely going to love it. Also note that this podcast is not the only way that I can help you for free. I have my due diligence framework. I have a bunch of other free resources you can get on buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash free resources. So make sure you check that out. Now let's have a chat with Nick. Nick, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, I've been looking forward to all week. Yeah, me too. Me too. So I wanted to ask you, first and foremost, you mentioned you had, but I, we didn't really dig into it before we hit the record buttons. Have you bought and sold sites and, and what, you know, how many have you bought? How many have you sold? What, is, what does that look like? Yeah, so I've had two micro exits. Uh, the first one was for $1,000. I built an e-commerce store selling knives uh, to Europeans, which I think technically makes me an international arms dealer. Um, and then I, I sold a second site that I built called doggypedia.org. I grew it to 100,000 organics a month. I couldn't monetize it. And I sold it to this uh, DDC brand called Alpha Pa, who who could monetize it. And I sold that for thirty thousand. Okay, cool. And so, was that a content site? The second one? Yeah, it was a, it was a content site, doggypedia.org. And what <coughs> was your motivation for buying versus starting? Yeah, so it was it was um, you know I think what attracts me to entrepreneurship is the unlimited surface area for learning. And so I just spent my entire career as a sales guy. I learned SEO by moving to an SEO company and taking like a ninety percent pay cut to, to sell SEO because I knew I'd learn it. And then once I figured out, I think I, I know it, uh, I left and um, Doggypedia was me proving to myself that I, I did know what I was doing. Um, and so it, it hit it went from zero to 100,000 organics a month in about 13 months. So you bought it, you would have bought it with very little traffic then? Zero traffic. I, I saw a cool domain name. I wanted to, to, to do a big project with lots of content and lots of traffic. Um, and it was a toss up between scarves, knives and, and puppies. And ultimately, I went with puppies because I could tell girls on Tinder, I'm a, I'm a puppy influencer. <laughs> I love it. So did you buy this as an age domain or did you buy it as a fresh, brand new domain? Completely fresh. I didn't build any backlinks. I focused... Uh, the entire strategy was focused on creating more valuable content than Google could show for any of the keywords I wanted to rank for. That was the second project I took to 100,000 organics a month. And then I would go on to, to take a project to 1.5 million organics a month using the same strategy. Okay, yeah, cool. So, so what? Um, so the first site you bought, where did you buy that buy that from, and how much do you spend on it? Yeah, so I actually the first site I actually built as well. Um, okay, and I I ended up selling it for a thousand dollars. It's it's the one I mentioned where I was selling knives to Europeans. The problem is is that like 30 to 40 percent of the knives would get confiscated at customs. And so the more knives I sold, the more money I lost. And so it wasn't yeah, a very yeah. good business. I sold it for a thousand bucks to some other yeah. poor guy. 
So you started <laughs> so, you, the two, you, so you started both of those. Yeah, those are the two I've sold. I've started a lot of other businesses that um, you know mostly unsuccessful in the early in the beginnings and and doing a little bit better on the the back end of my career. Yeah, is it's it's interesting because a lot of people come to buying a website and they go, oh, it's really hard to find them, and and um, they're not very patient. They have this lofty expectation that they're going to be a gazillionaire in like you know, six months time. And then they rush off and go, oh, I could just build this myself. And I think, well, I mean, you could, but do you have like all the years of SEO experience that you had, Nick, before you even started? And some of them for you as an SEO with all that years of experience in the career still flopped. Um, it was so hard for me to monetize. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. Mm. So what do you mean by that? So you so you started getting traffic, but you didn't know how to monetize. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, this was about, I don't know, four years ago at this point. And I, I hadn't seen a lot of monetization opportunities. And I hadn't had a lot of chances to, to take shots at Target. And the, this, this, this first shot did not, um, did not go well. I think we were making negative $75 a month after our, our hosting costs. And so actually, actually, it's kind of a good story. I posted like, hey, I, d- I haven't made any money on this website, but here's all the things I learned. I grew the Pinterest to 40 million impressions. I got like a million you know, through Google Organic. I got a lot of traffic. Um, and, and I made a lot of friends on the, on the way. And Sam Parr from My First Million saw it. He tagged his friend Ramon and uh, his friend ended up buying it from me and so that's that's really good that you sold it you didn't have to put it on a marketplace you didn't have to stuff around with like so many people doing due diligence you just knew somebody <laughs> that had money and was ready to buy right that's so you sound like a pretty good selling experience uh well first you know he said he'll buy it and then he came in for for six thousand dollars and i said well it's got to be worth way more than six thousand dollars and so then i put it up yeah. on flippa and i did a bunch of hustling and facebook groups and i got a bidding war going and that got it up to, to 30,000. Um, people tell me I could have gotten more, but the guy I sold it to, I'm still friends with today. Uh, he's a customer of mine for my next SaaS, and, and I slept in his pool house for two weeks while we were doing the transaction. Um, and <laughs> That's so amazing. I, <laughs> yeah, he, um, it, it's a good story. It's really cool because how cool would it be if somebody was to buy a site and they hung out with the previous owner for two weeks? Like that's invaluable really <laughs> as a yeah, buyer. Of it, and for me to hang out with someone at several rungs above the ladder, he had previously built uh, the largest soap opera website on the internet and sold that. And then he took this brand called Alpha Paw, bought it actually. You should interview him next. He bought Alpha Paw, this dog ramp business is doing 700 K a year in revenue. And he grew to 35 million a year in revenue in like two years. I don't know. The numbers are like, they're in that ballpark. Yeah, cool. And so there's a dog business, was it? Yeah, yeah. And so my website was one of the several acquisitions that he did in in building kind of this $35 million a year run rate business. Yeah, cool. And so did he buy that as as growth by acquisition sort of strategy, buying a, a smaller dog site and, and merging it into that larger one? Was that a play for him? Yeah, just it, you know, it made sense. Um, he he had products that make a lot of money, and I had traffic that and no products to sell them. Um, and so I think uh, I think the website was better off under under their brand, and it allowed me. You know, I, I got I checked off the dog influencer for Tinder, and uh, I moved on to my next project. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> How did you go on Tinder? Um, <laughs> we don't need to answer that. I'm just, just yeah. Just I think uh, yeah. I think uh, I think there's yeah. We'll leave it at that. You took a site or a business from zero traffic to 1.5 million hits per month organic. Is that right? Yep, that's right. I did it in two years, and it wasn't vanity traffic like it was on Doggypedia. I learned my lesson, and the the, tra- the the traffic was so valuable. The the company we did it for was able to go from a seed stage to a two hundred and ten million dollar valuation um, from Andreessen and Horowitz, like the number one VC in that two year time frame. I just want to highlight something before we move on to this SEO strategy. People are thinking, okay, one point five million organic hits per month. What do I need to do as a blogger to to get that? Out. The one thing that you mentioned is you're creating 600 to 800 pieces of content a month. Guys, we need to be realistic with our yep. our expectations. You might have the goal of hitting 1.5 million or getting hits per month, but you may not be at the level where you have the, the time and the resources to do that right now. Was massive amounts of content a big part of the SEO strategy? And if so, what came before 
that? Like, how did you work out what content you were going to create? Uh, yeah. So it's, it's um, you know, John Mahler, uh, Google's kind of head of search PR, uh, recently said, it's hard to call a 30-page website authoritative. Now, in 2022, literally anyone can create a 30-page website. Anyone. Anyone can create a 30-page website. And so when you create a 30-page website, if Google were to rank your pages then Google would probably have to rank the pages of every 30-page website. And two things would happen. The first is Google's users would, would start getting scammed because anyone who throws up a 30-page website is now ranking for high commercial mm-hmm. keywords. The second is as, as soon as, you know, the next day you're going to get bumped off because, again, there's no barrier to creating this 30 pages. And so someone's going to do it tomorrow and they're going to push you off the first page. There'd be too much variability. And so when you publish a lot of content, you know, content is expensive. And what it tells Google is, hey, there's a business model that customers will pay me for behind this content. And to, in order to get customers to pay you, there has to be some sort of customer satisfaction. Um, and so I see a big content investment is kind of you throwing money on the table saying, hey, I'm an expert in this field. And so how did you work out what sort of, how many, how do you work out how many pieces of content you needed to to get to your did you set a goal first and then you worked out how many pieces of content you needed and then did you go all right how much what what are the keywords how one you of the things this? you know one of the one of the things i noticed when i was doing an analysis of the some of the biggest seo outcomes um, across across the industry things like zapier to hubspot but within verticals like for example the dog vertical and and the major players within there and what i found is that a a, a company like hubspot they have, I think, approximately 12,000 pages and generate, I don't know, 10 million visitors a month. When I did the math, HubSpot's only generating 50 visitors per page per month. And that trend generally holds true regardless of what website you're looking at. Regardless of Think about it. On average, each yeah, page will generate average, yeah. less than 100 visitors uh, a month. And so I, 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 that's where I kind of got the hint that publishing a lot of content could create a good outcome. You don't have to publish 600 pages a month like me. I've published 70 pages total and that content went on to generate a million organic views over the course of two years. The, the traffic went up to 50,000 a month. It flatlined and it hasn't really moved in the last two years. And, and so you don't need to publish 600 pages a month, but you can publish 10 pages a month. You can publish 20 pages a month. You can publish 40 pages a month. That's attainable. And you'll see a really business changing impact if you can do that. And so what's your take on the quality versus quantity? It sounds like you've gone for quantity. Did you sacrifice some quality? Like what's your like what's your take on this? Yeah, I'm really glad you asked that. You can't scale until you nail the quality. I tr- the everything that I've seen, I have over 250,000 keywords on page 1 across my projects. I've never built a paid backlink. And everything that I've seen across my career tells me that when you strive to publish the highest quality page of content that Google could show for the keywords that you want to rank for, and then you do that at scale, that's really all there is to this, you know, winning at SEO. Like, I'm not kidding about no technical BS and no backlinks. Like, it's all about quality and quantity. Yeah. Okay. So you obviously work out the quality first, make sure you can see that that type of content is ranking, and then you replicate it for all the other search terms and keywords that you're wanting to rank for. And just go... I talk to a lot of businesses who aren't so familiar with SEO and they're like, I want to rank for a keyword. I want to rank for a few keywords. I want to rank for a handful of keywords. And in actuality, there's not only a handful of keywords, there's hundreds of pages, maybe thousands of pages that can get you in front of a qualified audience who has money and is like, and, and so it's, it's not about, you know, creating the perfect landing page. It's how do you create a landing page for all the different ways people are searching for the features of your product? You know, think about a really good example of this is like Canva or a video editing product. You know, they're like in the average video editing product, people will use it for one of a hundred features, translations, resizing, like intros, outros. Each one of that could be a page that could capture user intent who needs a video editor and you just want to show them that one feature and how you can help them. Love it. So with these pieces of the content, you mentioned obviously didn't buy any backlinks, um, haven't paid paid for any backlinks, and they gain obviously natural links. What are some of the things, other things that you may have done within each piece of content? Did you, you know, H1s, H2s, internal links? Is there some things that each piece of content had to have that was like a necessity? Uh, H1s, H2s, tables, lists, bullet points, images, internal links, external links. 
when I'm competing from a place of weakness, I want to beat my competition on every single one of those. And so when I Google, the, the first thing I'll do is Google the keyword I want to rank for, and then I'll open up the top three to five results. And how many words do they have? How many H2s do they have? How many pictures do they have? Internal links, external links, tables. I want to beat them on every, every one of those things. Because what I found is that as long as the quality is, is good, one of the easiest ways to get better user engagement metrics is to create more of it. So if your competitor wrote a thousand words, write 1500 words because all things being equal, the user will stay longer than on your competitor's site and Google will reward Love you it. for so that. More, more, more. Awesome. Now, <laughs> yeah. So, well, obviously, you know, some people are thinking, all right, just get as much content out there as possible, but they are going to listen to this. And I am certain that a portion of people will go um, content, like just, just like, let's get as much content out there as possibly can in, in terms of quantity. And they miss the first step of like, hang on a second, let's get back to our competitive research. What's the search term that we're going for? What are our com competitors doing and how can we do it better? But what you mentioned is how can we do more, more of what they're doing? Yeah. Really good. The, those people, the people who just hear quantity are going to lose it's possible, and I'm not kidding here, it's possible to spend an infinite amount of money on content that doesn't rank or generate any business value. I, I, I've seen companies spend infinite amounts of dollars on content that no one will ever read. Um, and so it has to be good or you shouldn't scale. Awesome. I love it. You're obviously going to need a lot of writers to write this content. Where, like, I want to ask about work, hello. Yeah. What was your motivation behind that? Was that to just have access to a lot of writers? <laughs> or, yeah, what was your motivation behind this? Uh, so I'm a SaaS guy. Um, uh, and earlier in the conversation, I said I was a SaaS, like a, a sales guy my whole life for, for early stage SaaS company. I was employee number eight at a company that grew to 200 people. I was doing, uh, I was doing a lot of fun stuff. And, and that's kind of my background. This whole SEO services thing is kind of like a pit stop. I looked at my career and I said, hey, marketing will serve my skill set better, my, my, my goals better than a sales guy. So I got to learn marketing. But ultimately, it was to build a SaaS product. So I'm actually six years into my five-year plan where I quit my sales job to learn SEO to use to launch a SaaS product. And sorry, what was the question? The question is, what was your motivation around why you started Work Ello? So this client that I was publishing 600 pages a month, they would take all of the capacity I could bring online. And so the biggest bottleneck for my agency business growth was how many writers could I hire? And so I ended up spending about a thousand to 2000 hours figuring out how to build the perfect system for hiring good, affordable writers very easily. And I think, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the industry, I, I probably spent more time thinking about how to hire writers than, than anyone um, because of this experience and their unlimited budget and our crazy success. And so I also started realizing our community also had the same problems. Everybody struggles hiring writers. Writers submit portfolio content that is heavily edited by someone else and doesn't reflect the content that they'll submit to you. Um, writing's the lowest barrier work from home job, which means all of your candidate, most of your candidates are going to be aspirational. They work at a grocery store, they, work, they dig ditches, and they say, hey, I want to work from home. I speak English, kind of. I should apply for writing roles. Yeah. And, and, and so it ends up being very difficult to hire good writers consistently. And I crack the code. Um, and so going back to my SAS roots, I built a product I've launched to the community and the community um, has evaluated more than 15,000 writing candidates in the last couple of months. So people can use this to find quality writers based on, how they've been audited in their skills and stuff like that. Is that right? Yeah. So it's a pre-hire assessment platform. And essentially candidates come in and you send a writing test to the best candidates and they'll go ahead and they'll complete that writing test for you. And so when you're making a hiring decision, it's not based off of education, resume, or portfolio that's probably fake. It's based off of the writing test they just took that's only for you. And so you know it wasn't plagiarized. Yeah, it's interesting when you go on Upwork or Fiverr or anything like that, you've got people that can talk to talk and then you ask them to do the task and you're like, oh, this is really oh, a letdown, right? How, yeah. How do they have five stars? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they paid for those stars probably. What does, you know, so say somebody um, does want to hire writer. People listening to this are all content writers, content creators, and they're going to... Well, they have most people here listening will have blogs or want to buy a blog or create some level of content for their business, whether it's a, a 
blog or not, what should yeah. people be thinking about before they even decide to hire a writer? Uh, so there's two things that I say to make it work. Um, the first is you need documentation. So what I found is I can't hold anyone accountable to anything that I haven't written down, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to content writing, because in content writing, every word is a liability to mess something up. Spelling, grammar, positioning, messaging, formatting. You give two people the same topic and you're going to get completely different content. There's too much variability in the way that people are going to deliver what you're looking for. And so if you want it done in a particular way, it, it has to be documented because it doesn't work unless it's documented. The second thing you need to do is you need to find people who care. Um, going back to every word in content writing, a bit, being a liability, how do you publish hundreds of thousands of liabilities per month without making mistakes? The, the people need to care. Generally, what we advise for people who are starting a new blog is, you know, hire five writers, give them a couple articles a month. And then in two months, you're probably only going to have one or two writers left because you fired the rest of them for, for being flaky, for not meeting timelines, for not learning. When you gave them feedback, they kept on making the same mistake. You know, they, they cheated on the test. Uh, yeah, they don't care <laughs> as well. They don't care. They, care they stop caring. Yeah. They stop caring. Yeah. So what about... So you talked about documenting, doc, ha having documentation of how the work's done. Basically, this is a SOP, right? Standard Operating Procedure. Uh, this is what That's we fair. have in place before we even decide to hire. We know a result that we want to achieve uh, and we know what that yep. looks like. And then we reverse engineer that result on what it looks like. And then we reverse engineer how it's actually done, have it documented. And it can be done through, um, you know, Google Sheets, Google Docs, uh, and video and stuff like that. Is that what you mean by having documentation, having a good SOP for somebody to, who has no idea how to write a piece of content to creating, to be able to create something that gets a result? Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't just extend to like implementation. It goes all the way to like, what's our PTO and maternity leave policy? Mm -hmm. And like, you know, how do you, how do you request? How do you like, how do you, basically anything in the organization that needs to get done more than once mm. is documented. So it's done consistently and repeatedly, you know, every time. I like to have the document, like have the SOP, but I also like to have a, a, a SOP for test work. So what we like to do is we like to find say 10 people, put them through the funnel of the test, see who comes out the, you know, at the bottom of the test and they might yeah. be two or three people put those two to three people through our, you know, we'll hire them to do, you know, a task, two or three tasks, put them through the, our own company's SOP. And then whoever gets their best result, we stick with. And if it changes, that result changes over a couple of months time, then we go back to the same process again, or tr test out the other two that made it through the first test. Is that, is that, a, but, you know, where, you know, what should we be doing better? Um, or is there things that we can do to add on to that? <laughs> or do differently based on what you've experienced? Yeah, great question. So your overall strategy uh, is very solid. Um, it's it's funny how frequently this, this occurs, but what I found the number one lever for hiring better writers is evaluate and test more candidates. If you evaluate and test two or three candidates, you're not going to hire the best. You're going to hire the least worst. Mm -hmm. Got ya. If you only evaluate a couple candidates, you're going to hire the least worst. You're going to spend too much time editing and you're going to terminate them or they're going to quit. Mm -hmm. um, Test 10 candidates. That's good. We test 50 or 100 candidates. I love it. Right? Because um, the more surface area you give yourself, the, the more likelihood you have to find and discover that hidden talent. Just like the number one lever to get better SEO results is publish more content. The number one way to get more outbound sales results is do more outbound. You know, the number one way to hire better writers is evaluate and test more writers. Cool. Uh, you just dropped out there, uh, but... I'm pretty sure I know the rest of the answer, but I wanted to add to this as well because people are sitting here and listening to this podcast and going, wow, test 150 to 100 candidates. That's a lot of time on my hands. Well, no, not actually. If you have a good test SOP that they can run through, you can put a thousand people through it and then still work out you know, who's, who's the top 20 or top 10 without it costing you any more time, right? So th I think people are missing yeah. so many steps here that are very vital. <laughs> that's exactly right. And that's exactly why we built Workello to enable companies to actually reach that amount of tests that they need to find those candidates 
who are good, affordable, and are going to stick with them for a long time. And so with writers, are you hiring just writers and then just editors? So you have, so the piece of content will touch by multiple people <clears throat> along the process. What does that process look like from creation to published? Yeah, absolutely. So for anyone listening to this podcast, you're going to be like me. Uh, you're a business owner and content and SEO is a channel that you're using to exploit. We don't actually care about the words too much that are getting written. And so the first thing that like, as soon as possible, take yourself out of the editing process. Uh, you're going to do it initially. Um, but your company is going to be better off if you can stop worrying about the words on the paper and you can focus on revenue generating activities. My business didn't take off until I hired an editor who ended up scaling with me to editor, content manager, project manager, director of operations, and now my co-founder helping me build work yellow and helping um, you know other content teams hire better writers. Love it. Going back to caring, caring is the the one thing that you can't evaluate in an interview cycle over two or three touch points with an editor. Um, the easiest thing for an editor to do is let things slide. You won't know how much they care until they start. And so all of our editors start off as writers because you can't fake caring for two to three to four to five to six months that you're going to be a writer before getting promoted. Mm. And at this point, we've promoted pr probably over 10 writers to editors, PMs, and other senior roles within our organization. Love it. So you basically start off with a writer edit yourself at the start because you don't have an editor if you're just a newbie to this and then after you know x amount of data points um, and articles written and you understand that the writer cares you can promote them to editor and put other people do another test of candidates for the um for the writing of it that's and that's then, exactly right i just tweak it and then you have the i just tweak uh, it a person Sorry, who is the ahead. editor actually help and support and teach the the previous writer right that's the that's the that's the real goal because then you can step away from it without having to do that's exactly right for the first for the writer again yeah that's exactly right the only thing i tweak is don't work with one writer because if that writer is not good now you don't have an editing candidate mm -hmm. just like the more writers you test the better writers you'll hire the more writers you hire the better editors you'll promote yeah <laughs> um it's all like a pipeline problem it is uh it's all systems and pipelines it's just the numbers game right it's just a numbers game. And so when you promote this person to editor, now it allows you to focus on like, you know, level up and, and kind of focus on higher level at the business. But you don't want that person to stop there because editing is just where you want them to begin. You also want them to take over hiring because you don't like that either. You want them to take over all the SEO stuff you don't want to do. You just give them a doc and they have to follow it and, and do SEO. And, and so there's kind of this dance where I, I hired this editor and then as she took stuff off my plate, I could level up. And then I gave her the next batch of stuff I didn't want to do. And then she leveled up mm -hmm. and then she would backfill the position behind her. And if they get stuck at editor, you still need someone to become your content manager and take over all content production. Absolutely love it. What are your top two or three tips for somebody that's looking at hiring and has no idea other than what we've already talked about? Um, you know, early on in my, in my career, I had to make a decision on whether to underpay Americans uh, or overpay foreigners. Um, yeah. And I decided that, uh, you know, I wasn't sure about this whole American exceptionalism thing. I'm not sure it exists. And I decided to hire a bunch of foreigners. And ultimately, I think uh, it was the right move to overpay, you know, people that don't live in a, the U.S. and rather than hire, hire people in the U.S. Um, it kind of changed my life. I ended up moving to Europe to support the team and, and build it. And I've been in Europe for three years. And um, even though my life is still boring, uh, it's all happening in a foreign country and, and that makes it kind of exciting. Cool. Cool. So overpaying, overpaying foreigners to get you the results. Yeah, absolutely. You know, people will ask, Hey, can non-native English speakers speak English? And my response is always the department of education says that 54% of Americans have an eighth grade reading level or less. Wow. And so most Americans can't speak English very good. And my team would chime in and say, Nick, it's well, because they spent, they got their master's degree studying all the grammar rules that we forgot in seventh grade. Yeah. Yeah. Or some people didn't even get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's tens of millions of, of non-native English speakers that speak better English than Americans. And, and if you, if you feel like you're, you're not able to hire abroad very well, 
I would say I would go back to the number of candidates you're putting in your pipeline and, and that you're evaluating is probably the problem. And you can test it as well, right? You can have a candidate for, you can have a funnel for native English speaking and non-native English speaking and then test them against each other and sort of, it's all a, all a test. You can see which works best for you. That's right. But in COVID times where you're not applying for jobs 25, you know, within 25 miles, you're applying for any yeah, job, yeah. you know, all those, all those grocery store people really want to work from home and they're applying for your writing job. And so, you know, I think regardless of where you're hiring from or how much you're willing to pay, you're going to have low value candidates crowding out any type of job you post. And really the trick is, if 5% of my candidates are qualified and talented, how do I filter out the 95% so I'm only left with the 5% and do it in an efficient, fast way? Love it. Absolutely love it. Nick, thanks so much for coming on. Where can we send people to check out more about what you're doing at Work LO and, and everywhere else? So we just dropped a 7,000-page uh, guide on how to publish 100 pages a month. You can find it on workello.com. You can also check out our YouTube channel, contentdistribution.com, because we have a video version. And then you can go to facebook.com slash content distribution. Search for Fat Graph Content Ops on Facebook, uh, and we run the, the largest content ops community with yeah, 6,000 members. Yeah, I've got a link to that here. So we'll, we'll be putting those in the show notes. So thanks so much. Yeah, really appreciate you coming on and sharing everything that you've learned in your career. And congrats on like from going from sales to SEO to building these other businesses. I think it's really cool on you thinking about the long term. Um, I like playing long term games with long term people. Uh, and you know those are the people that win and, and have a lot more fun and do it with less stress. <laughs> Th thank you. I'll leave you with one thing that served me well. When I was 19, I told myself, whether I get rich or not on my first startup, I'm going to meet the people and do the things or meet the people and learn the skills to do something even bigger next. And I've basically just been following that for the last 15 years and working at higher and higher scale. Um, and you're totally right about the long game. You know, all the values created at the end. Yeah, I love it. Thanks so much. Everybody that is listening as well, thank you so much for listening. If you know somebody that's going to own a content site or already does, do them a massive favor and share this podcast episode with them. There's so many gems from SEO, content creation, and hiring that are so valuable for your buddies to know. Selfishly, it helps myself grow Bob, Nick grow as well in, in front of more audience, but the real value is you helping your friends out with a valuable piece of content. So thanks so much for sharing, guys, and I'll speak to you soon. Hey, YouTube watcher, if you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out. It's an awesome playlist. You'll enjoy it.